Tokyo, March 1995. The world's first terrorist attack using nerve gas. Twelve underground commuters were killed. Another 5,000 needed medical treatment. It was a sinister reminder that nerve gas remains a threat to us all. Our towns and cities are soft targets for one of this century's most lethal weapons, invented for the battlefield. The story of poison gas goes back to the carnage in the trenches of the First World War. It was here that chemical weapons were first introduced. I was vomiting. The effect of gas was similar to uh, drowning. It took off the lining of the lung. She sent the fish, but she sent the fish to the gas. In the bomb. And then, when you have the bomb, you have to put it on the other side of the mask. Then, you have the tongue out, and the eyes are shining, and you have the luft, and the air is filled with the air. 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 The first weapon of mass destruction. Poison gas unleashed a new era in the grim history of war. It was the product of a perverse alliance that has shaped the century, the alliance of soldiers and scientists. When war broke out in 1914, the German high command was confident that Britain and France would soon be defeated. It would all be over by Christmas. But by winter, a line of trenches stretched from the Channel to Switzerland. Total stalemate. Neither side could break through. One of Germany's leading scientists, Fritz Haber, offered the fatherland a way out of the impasse. My father was first and foremost a German. I think originally, probably, science was more important than Germany. But once you come to the First World, World War period, I think then it became Germany. You know, how do you defeat your enemies? What can you think of? What can you contribute, you as a scientist? What's your contribution going to be? Er war eine enorm starke Persönlichkeit mit diesem Wahnsinnswillen, auch diese Kraftanstrengung. Es war ja eine geistige und auch eine physische Anstrengung, dass er da nicht nachgegeben äh, hat. Und das ist tatsächlich nur durch seine überstarke Motivation zu erklären, seine Aufgabe, seine Pflicht, er war sehr preußisch, erfüllen zu wollen. Of Jewish origin, Dr. Haber was an internationally respected scientist. He'd already invented a process for extracting nitrates from the atmosphere. Still famous today, the Haber-Bosch process was used by Germany's vast chemical industry to manufacture fertilizers and later explosives. Without it, Germany could not have gone to war. In 1902, Haber had renounced his Judaism and become a Christian. The fact that he was uh, of Jewish origin plays a great part in his endeavor to show to the Germans that Jews can uh, be uh, as good citizens as non-Jews. Not only Fritz, but also other people who had, who had left uh, Judaism and uh, uh, converted to Christianity, they wanted to show to the German people that they are more Germans than the Germans. Haber dedicated himself to his country in its hour of need. He was determined to use his scientific expertise to put an end to the military deadlock. Er hatte dann die Idee, das Gas durchdringt die Festungen des Gegners, durchdringt Gräben, geht durch andere Schutzdinge hindurch. Und es war seine Idee, eben diese Fronten auf die Art und Weise aufzubrechen, die ganze Sache wieder in Bewegung zu bringen und äh, den Krieg wieder in, in, in Gang zu setzen. He possibly foresaw that it wouldn't be an easy war to win. I think the gas, this seemed an inexpensive 
way in which you might damage or kill quite a number of enemy troops. Harbour knew that each day the chemical industry produced tons of poison gas as a byproduct. In his laboratory, he searched for ways to apply these gases to the battlefield. Es ging jetzt äh, darum, äh, Substanzen zu finden, die für einen Großeinsatz militärisch geeignet waren. Das heißt, sie mussten also Temperaturschwankungen aushalten, sie mussten sich in freier Luft äh, verteilen können. Das musste getestet werden. Harbour set about testing like a man inspired. In his Berlin Institute, founded by Kaiser Wilhelm, he began to research an asphyxiating gas widely used in the dye industry, chlorine. Across the lawn at his home just opposite, he faced bitter opposition from an unexpected source. His wife Clara was also a chemist. She was convinced that science and war were morally incompatible, however noble the cause. For Clara, chemical warfare was a perversion of science. She had rendered her service, uh, her oath on science in 1900 as the first woman to get a PhD in chemistry um, at the Breslau University. And uh, at that moment, she had sworn to use science only to the benevolence of mankind and not to dis for the destruction of mankind. She, in fact, had very great moral doubts about the gas warfare and he really didn't pay any attention. He did not believe that either children or wives should interfere too much with his life and his science. Aware of his wife's ethical objections, Harbour sought to keep his work a secret. But one day in December 1914, he could conceal his activities no longer. Herauszufinden war natürlich nicht schwer. Es gab zwar die militärischen Geheimnisse, aber das passierte ja also nebenan. Sie guckte aus dem Fenster und sah das Institut. Dann eines Tages war ein großer Knall, eine ungewöhnliche laute Explosion und sie fand ähm, einen Kreis um jemanden auf dem Boden gebildet und da war nur noch Haut und Blut und nicht zu erkennen und nur Clara kniete sich hin und sagte, er lebt. Schneidet ihm den Kragen auf, er kriegt keine Luft. There had been an explosion of poison gas in the lab. The dying man was Clara's great friend and former colleague, a chemist named Otto Secur. Clara had introduced him to her husband. From the moment she watched him die, her dislike of the research grew till it became total hatred. But her husband pressed on regardless. At the end of 1914, Harbour approached the military. He promised them chlorine gas would bring rapid victory. Germany was the only country that could produce it in the vast quantities required. But the high command was not convinced. Zum ersten Mal in der Karriere solchen Generals kam man mit Wissenschaftlern zusammen und das war, also man kannte sich einfach nicht und das war sicher von beiden Seiten auch mit gewisser Skepsis beladen und es war gar nicht so einfach dort eine Zusammenarbeit zu finden. The chiefs of staff agreed on the potential of chemical warfare, but it went against their military traditions. Germany had signed the Hague Convention, banning the use of gas in war. This early in the conflict, they held back from breaking an international agreement. They were still clinging on to their chivalrous ideals. Der Offizier, der auf dem Schlachtfeld mit seinem gezogenen Säbel seinen Männern voranschreitet, mir nach, der die Männer ins, äh, in den Kampf führt, ja, äh, das ist die Vorstellung des äh, ritterlichen Krieges. Aber der Gaskrieg war eine völlig andere Realität, denn der Offizier bestimmte nicht den Angriff. Der Chemiker musste die Mittel zur Verfügung stellen. On the army's test site near Cologne, Harbour showed the high command the murderous power of his new invention. The first um, field tests happened to be here at this area where we are standing right now. Clara was with him, and since her inner attitude was against these tests, uh, I think that her desperation must have increased uh, from day to day. 
Harbour the Patriot was unmoved. He showed that if the wind blew in the right direction, gas from the cylinders would blow towards enemy lines, killing or maiming all in its path. The war dragged on. As more and more Germans were caught up, the generals set their scruples aside. Early in 1915, they decided to use Harbour's new weapon. Assigned a military rank, Harbour helped the High Command supervise the gas corps. At Ypres, on April the 22nd, 1915, they opened the valves, releasing a cloud of chlorine five feet high. In the easterly breeze, it rolled gently towards the unsuspecting French and Algerian troops. Viele haben es beschrieben, als dass ihnen das Leben Stück für Stück richtig aus dem Leib herausgequetscht worden wäre, dass sie kurz vorm Ersticken waren. Sie konnten ja keine Luft holen, die meisten hat ja die Lunge betroffen. Und das sprach sich natürlich rum, dass also Gase solche Wirkung haben können und das löste Panik aus. There were 10,000 casualties. Terrified soldiers died where they fell as the cloud enveloped them. Corpses lay scattered along the trenches. Everything in the cloud's path turned green. Bayonets, watches, even human skin. War had changed forever. There have been lots of dead in wars before, no doubt greater numbers than that, but as suddenly as that, and from one operation, this was the, the great change of chemical warfare. This showed what, what science in mobilized war could actually do. The trend was set. There were other chemicals. There was biological weapons, radiological weapons, nuclear weapons. The whole progression of mass destruction was opened up on that day. But to Harbour's disappointment, the horror at Ypres was only a fraction of what it could have been. The Germans wasted an opportunity. They had a weapon of great surprise. They didn't actually anticipate uh, that this would be so effective. It was a largely a diversionary attack um, because they were concentrating the Eastern Front at the time. Uh, they didn't have the follow-up forces ready, and so it was a missed golden opportunity. But German newspapers hailed the attack as a great victory. It was justified as humane, one writer claiming, the letting loose of smoke clouds is an extraordinarily mild way of waging war. At the age of 40, Harbour became a national hero. He was promoted to captain, the first scientist to be embraced by the military. Er wurde wichtig, er wurde einer der wichtigsten Männer an der Schnittstelle so zwischen Wissenschaft, Wirtschaft, Militär. Er konnte was bewegen und Wissenschaft blieb also nicht in den vier Wänden eines Instituts stehen, sondern da hat sich äh, im breitesten Maßstab was getan. Und das hat ihn sicher fasziniert. The night after his promotion, Captain Harbour held a dinner party to celebrate. But for his wife, the first gas attack was no cause for rejoicing. Clara was mortified that her husband's scientific skill had been used to kill fellow humans. Disgusted at his pride in the work, she continued to protest. Clara had uh, dafür gekämpft, dass uh Benutzen von Massenvernichtungsmitteln, dass man das als Wissenschaftler zu verantworten hat und dass man nicht einfach was erfinden kann, sondern dass man ähm, da äh, etwas aus der Hand gibt, äh, was Folgen hat. Der Ausdruck Perversion der Wissenschaft wird benutzt. She reproached him uh, that he uses uh, science uh, as a means of war, and this is uh, contrary to all humanitarian attitude. But uh, for Fritz, the, the fatherland, Germany, was, uh, was of uh, greater importance. She, he, he called her a traitor of Germany. That night, they had a furious argument. Clara realized her husband would never change but she too would not compromise. It was a matter of life and death. Clara had, tief in the night, as Fritz slept, sich mit seiner Dienstpistole erschossen, 
einen Schuss in die Luft, um zu probieren, ob das Ding funktioniert. Und den nächsten hat sie auf ihr Herz gerichtet. Sie hat bis zum Schluss gekämpft und äh, sie konnte ihm nicht klar machen, dass das ein Missbrauch seiner Verantwortung ist. Sie konnte aber wohl sagen, also wenn du das tust, dann ohne mich. And the tragedy is that uh, the next morning uh, Fritz uh, went to the Eastern Front. He didn't care about the corpse of, uh, of his uh, wife at all. He went to the Eastern Front and he let the next gas war attack. In Britain, there had been outrage over the use of gas at Ypres. Initially, it was called an atrocious weapon of war. It used to be called frightfulness by the British press. Uh, it was considered quite underhand and unsporting. Um, but once it was used, of course, then there was desire to retaliate and to, of course, defend against it. British scientists had been caught totally unprepared. There was only makeshift protection. For want of anything better, they recommended the use of cloths moistened with urine. There was a rush to produce gas masks. They were soon on sale, but public pressure for retaliation was growing. The king himself took a personal interest. In May 1915, the cabinet gave the go-ahead for the development of gas. A special gas brigade was set up. The recruits included university professors. Within five months, five and a half thousand cylinders of chlorine gas were moved to the Western Front. At Luz on September the 25th, the British launched their first gas attack. It backfired badly. Halfway through, the wind changed and blew the gas back on the Allies, showing the new weapon's biggest defect. To try and improve their poison gas and rival the Germans, the government set up a chemical warfare establishment at Porton Down near Salisbury. Well, Porton was um, an experimental field. It was set up very soon after the cabinet had taken the decision to retaliate in kind against the German uh, poison gas warfare. And people descended upon it and started to do experiments with chlorine and all these other things under conditions of vast urgency and stress. Gas was soon being used regularly by both sides. In 1916, 15,000 tons of chlorine were discharged. Gas alerts became routine. But the soldiers' hatred and fear of it never lessened. Breaking all the taboos of war, gas was uniquely sinister. Eine Granate, die explodiert, die sieht man und hört man. Und wenn man den Kopf in den Graben nimmt, dann hat man auch einen gewissen Schutz und dann ist die Wirkung vorbei. Aber Gas ist eben unheimlich, weil es still ist und weil es dauerhaft wirken kann. Also selbst wenn Sie aus dem Graben herauskommen als Soldat, müssen Sie befürchten, dass Gas in den Trichtern noch vorhanden ist. Was viele Menschen beeindruckt hat, ist natürlich die Vorstellung, dass hier ein industrieller Massenmord stattfindet. Everything was done by both sides to protect their men. As the war went on, masks became more effective. So did the training. They issue you these gas masks, which you carry with you all the time, and then they put you through a, a, a maneuver, put the gas mask on properly. They'd examine it whether you got it on properly, you know, no leaks on. Then they put you through a, a, a gas hut full of gas, you see, on purpose. Once you've got past there, then you're a past in gas, and you wore your gas mask all the time. In an early arms race, scientists developed new means of attack to break through improved enemy protection. At Porton Down, they replaced the unwieldy gas cylinders with shells. Das trieb diese Spirale, die sich da in Gang setzte, also unablässig voran. 
Man versuchte, Gase zu entwickeln, von denen man wusste oder annehmen konnte, dass der Feind sie zunächst mal nicht kennt und eben die gegnerischen Gasmasken durchbrechen wird. Man versucht also, deswegen war es auch so besonders auch wichtig, von gefallenen Soldaten der anderen Seite die Schutzgeräte zu analysieren, erstmal gucken, was können die, was leisten die, was, was haben denn die schon äh, entwickelt, um darauf äh, die neuen äh, Substanzen abzustellen. In 1916, Harbour's laboratory trumped the Allies by producing a new, more noxious gas, phosgene, 18 times more powerful than chlorine. Its effect soon horrified war-weary doctors who thought they'd seen everything. Victims drowned slowly in liquid produced by their own lungs. In northern Italy, the potential of this new gas was seen when it was used against an unprotected enemy. At Caporetto, the Italians had built a strong line of defences against attack from Germany's ally, Austria. The hills on the border overlooking the Sochi River had become an impregnable position. For two years, the Italians had beaten back Austrian assaults. But in autumn 1917, Germany's specialist gas divisions were summoned in a desperate attempt to break the stalemate. That October, the German gas brigade bombarded the Italians with phosgene. Austrian and German generals watched the gas cloud drift off towards the enemy. Totally unprotected, the Italian troops were quickly overcome. So scappato e sentivo la morte oramai che veniva. Eh, oramai mi ho visto senza maschera, oi. L'ho fatto ora portarmi fuori sempre che a nuvola non ho io che c'ho da largo a nuvola, sai. Pensavo altro che la fine della vita. Perché dico se io ti ci do una bufata di che fumo, so a posto. Fortuna. On the attacking side, Ivan Kovacic advanced with the Austro-Hungarian infantry. He was stunned by what he saw. So, postal, samo to povi tam in vojaki so vsi mrtvi. Je po i plinih je po isku, ne vem koliko ih lovoko pod zemljo, če so bili vojaki skriti notru v kavernah, pa vse tako plini in lezu kar na tla. Je bila tiska vse in je šlo na roke. Če smo mi šli mimo, ki smo dovolj tudi mrtve ki s plenem. It was the most lethal demonstration so far of the killing power of gas when victims had no protection. After years of gridlock, phosgene had brought about one of the war's most dramatic breakthroughs. But on the Western Front, Protection against chlorine and phosgene soon became so effective that another, more lethal gas was called for. Fritz Haber's institute set to work. His aim was to find a gas that would make gas masks useless by attacking the skin as well as the lungs. He soon came up with a new horror, mustard gas. Lost or uh, mustard gas had man then also a new uh, Kampfstoff entwickelt der also sesshaft ist. Der Vorteil war, dass er eben nicht wie die bisher eingesetzten flüchtig war, sondern eben ein sesshafter Kampfstoff, der im Gelände und an der Kleidung haftete, der über die Haut wirkte und damit war ein Schutz des Gegners unmöglich. The vicious new gas assaulted the lungs and skin of its victims. Patches of skin affected erupted into massive yellow blisters. Harbour's new weapon was used as soon as it was ready. From July 1917, mustard gas tore into Allied troops. The mustard gas is worse than chlorine because the mustard gas uh, ate away the body. 
it uh, take the warm parts of the body. That's under the arms and between the legs. It will take the skin off, you see. And uh, the, uh, the, they will, will so I've heard men cry just like children. In the first three weeks of its use, mustard gas killed or injured 14,000 Allied men. The first sign of its approach was the stench, a nauseous mix of garlic and mustard. Birds in its path fell from trees. Rats and mice died in their thousands. Allied soldiers were stunned. Symptoms weren't always immediate. As well as ravaging the skin and lungs, it damaged the eyes and could cause blinding. You didn't know your gas until you came out in the daylight. Then you found that the sun was too bright, and you didn't look at the daylight, it was so bright, you had to keep your eyes shut, and you had to feel your way. Then they took you down to what they call first aid, holding the man's shoulder in front of you, with about three miles behind the line, then they tried to attend to you. They told me if I was lucky, if I gave up wine and women, I might live another ten years. <laughs> As the war approached its climax, the Germans used mustard gas as a key weapon in their last campaign. 150,000 shells were fired at the Allies. By September 1918, the British had produced their own version. That October, on the Belgian front, they unleashed mustard gas on the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry. An obscure corporal by the name of Adolf Hitler was among the victims needing medical treatment. He later wrote that it was the horror of being gassed that drove him out of the army and into politics. In November 1918, Germany surrendered. Gas had added to the horrors of war. But far from producing a rapid German victory, it had failed to prevent the fatherland's defeat. Fritz Haber was devastated. A friend described him as 75% dead after his country's humiliation. I do remember going with him to see, I think it's Schiller's Joan of Arc. And he actually cried. I wept copiously because for some reason or other, that seemed to move, move him. Mainly, I think, because Joan of Arc, again, there was a figure that tried to defend her country against all the enemies, didn't she? Thanks to gas masks and the vagaries of the wind, the world's first weapon of mass destruction hadn't decided the war. But it had killed over a hundred thousand men. Over a million had been poisoned by it and would bear its marks on their shattered lungs for years. Harbour himself continued to proclaim it was a superb terror weapon. Every change of sensation in the nose and mouth, he wrote, nags in the mind. It creates utter confusion, eroding the soldier's inner strength. But others saw gas as the most inhumane weapon of a conflict that had plumbed the depths of man's inhumanity to man. Es war eine wichtige Waffe, weil sie zur Demoralisierung der Soldaten entscheidend beigetragen hat. Also die Millionen Soldaten auf beiden Seiten der Front haben diese, diese Eindrücke vom, vom Gaskrieg mit nach Hause genommen und das waren eigentlich die schlimmsten Eindrücke des, des Krieges. Fritz Haber had feared he'd be tried as a war criminal. He did not have worried. In 1919, in honor of his pre-war work on nitrates, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. He continued his quest for new gas weapons, disguising it as research into pest control. Die Chemie liefert uns zu diesem Kampf die schärfsten Waffen, die Giftgase. In den Flaschen ist das Gift noch flüssig, aber beim Versprühen verdampft es schnell. Er hat genauso gewusst, dass die Ergebnisse, die er bei den Testen von Schädlingsbekämpfungsmitteln gewonnen hat, dass man die auch wieder umsetzen kann für militärisch nutzbare äh, Ergebnisse. 
Und er hat dies nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg auch durchaus getan, indem Formen von Schädlingsbekämpfungsinstitutionen eigentlich genutzt worden sind als getarnte Militärforschungseinrichtungen. Gas! Gas! In the 1920s, Harbour developed another toxic gas, derived from hydrocyanic acid. A powerful insecticide, in enclosed spaces, it could also kill humans with great efficiency. Its name, Zyklon B. Twenty years on, it would be used to commit mass murder in Nazi death camps. Die tragische Dimension ist natürlich, dass dieses Zyklon B während des Zweiten Weltkriegs dann gegen Menschen eingesetzt worden ist, in den Konzentrationslagern und zur Vernichtung der Juden, also von Habers eigenem Volk, äh, eingesetzt worden ist. Ich denke, das ist wirklich eine Dimension, die Haber nicht bewusst gewesen ist. Vielleicht im Jahr 1933 mit der Machtübernahme der Nationalsozialisten ihm bewusst geworden ist, was daraus hat werden können. In The new Nazi rulers were convinced gas would be a vital weapon in future warfare. International law had forbidden its use, but Hitler had been deeply impressed by its effectiveness. Nazi leaders ordered secret research. Scientists were urged to help the fatherland. An alle Erfinder, an die Männer der Wissenschaft, denkt nach, laboriert, experimentiert. Gebt uns neue Anregungen, neue Erfindungen und neue Möglichkeiten. Und ihr habt Großes für Deutschland getan. But this time, Fritz Haber, who had created the first real bond between the military and science, wasn't wanted. He had a letter to say that he, Fritz Haber, could stay. But the Jewish uh, collaborators, assistants, would have to go. So Fritz Haber answered this letter and said, in that case, you have my resignation. And that was the end, virtually. He was already a basic man. I think the coming of the Nazis really more or less fixed him. Rejected by the fatherland he'd served so single-mindedly, Haber left Germany forever. His health collapsed. An exile, he died in Switzerland in 1934. He was buried here in Basel. His last request, to be buried next to his wife, Clara. Habers Leben hat eine tragische Dimension. Auf der anderen Seite ist ein besonders gutes Beispiel dafür, wie schwierig die Konversion militärisch, zivil, zivil, militärisch eigentlich überhaupt ist. Also das ist tatsächlich ein Punkt, der typisch ist für die moderne Wissenschaft, weil man Gut und Böse so einfach nicht mehr voneinander trennen kann. The thin line between good and evil would soon be crossed again in 1936. Another German chemist, Gerhard Schrader, had been working on a new group of pesticides, organophosphates, when he stumbled across a poison with unparalleled power. Was das ist, dass das als Schädlingsbekämpfungsmittel überhaupt nicht in Frage kommt, ist viel zu gefährlich und hat gesagt, hier, mit dem wollen wir nichts zu tun haben mit dem Stoff, das ist eher ein Kampfstoff. Schrader had chanced upon the nerve gas taboon, a gas which shatters the entire nervous system. He experimented on monkeys, making them touch or inhale minute amounts. They immediately had convulsions. They lost all muscular control and died of asphyxiation. Schrader obeyed a Nazi decree that any potential weapon be handed over to the military. Er war sehr nett und sehr kameradschaftlich. Er war ein gläubiger Christ. Und das muss ihm gewisse Wissensbisse erweckt haben, dass er sich mit so einer Substanz abgeben muss, nicht? Aber inwieweit sie sich... Wahrscheinlich war das auch im Rahmen einer, einer militärischen 
eingerufen, nicht wahr? Research he'd begun to help the growth of food was now hijacked to create another instrument of death. Schrader reluctantly agreed to perfect Taboon, working in utter secrecy. Soon, Hitler was on the verge of getting a new gas, far more powerful than the one that had poisoned him in the trenches. At the same time, Germany's new allies, the Italians, were showering mustard gas on the Abyssinians, a real-life demonstration that delivering gas by air could be truly lethal. In Britain, reports of the horrifying results led to terror about the nature of any future war. Everyone assumed gas would be used in the conflict looming with Germany. Fictions of the 30s have many, many vivid accounts of what the future of chemical warfare is going to be like. The dew of death, which would descend from one bomb and kill everybody between Regent's Park and the Thames, was one image at that time. People were looking for ways never to repeat the carnage, the hideous events of the First World War. By 1938, governments throughout Europe were starting to prepare their citizens for chemical warfare. In Britain, 30 million gas masks were handed out. To calm the public, newsreels stressed the lighter side of living with gas. Is my mask on straight, dear? They say that gossiping in one of these dinky new masks is quite an art. In parts of Czechoslovakia today, they're training the young people in the use of the gas mask. And to get them accustomed to wearing the mask, they make a song and dance about it. Well, a dance, anyway. Like his predecessors in the First War, Hitler formed a special gas corps, the Nebeltruppe. As Taboon wasn't yet perfected, they practiced using mustard gas, defying the Versailles Treaty to do so. Hans Haas and Alfred Stammwitz were recruited to the naval trooper 60 years ago. I have noch ein Anhänger ja, an einen Versuch. Hier ist noch ein, eine Vernarbung da zu sehen. Das, das waren Blasen, die waren ungefähr 3 cm dick. Ne? Lost, lost, ne? lost, lost. Nicht, denn Hitler hatte sich doch glatt drüber weggesetzt über den Versailler Vertrag. Und dann ging die Forschung los und alles, was dazugehört, die Waffenwissenschaft und, und, naja, und dann konnte praktisch anstelle von Nebelgranaten konnten Kampfstoffgranaten verschossen werden. But when World War II broke out in 1939, it turned out to be a very different type of conflict from World War I. It was quite simply far faster. The early German advances and their later retreats were so rapid gas wasn't an option. The Nebeltruppe were never required at the front. Solange wir im Vormarsch waren, hätten wir uns ja selbst geschadet, wenn wir die Gegend vor uns vergiftet hätten. Und als wir nachher zurück mussten und immer weiter zurück mussten, dann war das in einem Tempo, dass es gar nicht mehr möglich war, noch uns genügend durch Aufbau von Kampfstoffsperren zu schützen. Unable to use gas on the battlefield, the Germans still considered dropping it from the air on enemy towns and cities. Facing defeat at the front and with German cities reeling under Allied air raids, Hitler's staff implored him to go ahead. His Minister of Labour urged, we have this new poison gas. The Führer must use it. He simply has to. The former World War I corporal had already ensured there were adequate stockpiles. In 1939, he'd ordered the building of a vast nerve gas factory at Durenfurt in Silesia. Naturally, it was top secret. Dieses Projekt Dürrenfurt 
hatte immer absolute Priorität. Da gab es keine Kürzungen. Das war das groß, äh, größte deutsche äh, Rüstungsprojekt. 3000 workers had been sent to Durenfurt. It had been producing Tabun since early 1942. By 1944, Hitler had enough at his disposal to wipe out the population of London. The Allies knew nothing about the Tabun stockpiles. But from the outset, Churchill had warned Hitler against the use of chemical weapons, openly threatening to retaliate by bombarding German cities with killer gases. Churchill regarded gas as any other weapon. Uh, he did not see much point in distinguishing between one form and another. Indeed, he tended to regard that sort of reasoning as sentimental squeamishness. Uh, he had seen the carnage of conventional weapons and regarded gas as just another of the rather horrible methods uh, by which of inflicting injury and death on human beings. Fearing retaliation, Hitler never used nerve gas. London was spared. But it soon faced another new threat. Deprived of gas, Hitler ordered the rapid development and use of the flying bomb, the V1. 90mm anti-aircraft guns track the bombs as they carry more than a ton of explosives through the sky at pursuit plane speed. Doodlebug raids began in July 1944. Within a fortnight, there were 6,000 casualties. V2 rocket attacks followed. Churchill called for the use of gas in retaliation. The V1 weapon really was an indiscriminate weapon in the view of Churchill and, and therefore perhaps demanded special responses. So the chiefs of staff put the joint planning staff on to a study of whether gas should be used in retaliation against the doodlebugs. And in short order, the joint planning staff decided that really, no, it didn't make much sense. Which uh, stimulated Churchill to write one of his most famous um, uh, memoranda on the subject of chemical warfare. If the bombardment of London really became a serious nuisance, I should be prepared to do anything that would hit the enemy in a murderous place. It may be several weeks or even months before I shall ask you to drench Germany with poison gas. And if we do it, let us do it 100%. And again, they reconsidered it. And the calculation showed that if you wanted to drench German cities with poison gas, you simply hadn't the capacity to do it. If you, even if you did use a thousand bomber air raid and use total must, use mustard gas in it, you would be wasting your effort. Much greater effects were available from conventional weapons. The British High Command rejected the use of gas, preferring the widespread destruction caused by mass incendiary bombing. Throughout the war, both sides had expected gas warfare, but it had never come. Fear of retaliation had saved the peoples of Europe from chemical bombardment. After Germany's defeat, the Allies uncovered the secret supplies of nerve gas. The unused shells from Durenfurt were found stockpiled in their thousands. One was taken to Porton Down for analysis. Many of Germany's leading chemists were arrested. Die Herren wollten genau wissen, das Produkt, sich da, die Formel, das Verfahren der Herstellung, die Apparatur, wie es ihm gelungen ist, in der Apparatur ein solches Produkt herzustellen, das so, so verheerende Wirkungen hatte. Und es hat ja keinen Sinn mehr, da jetzt vom Berg zu halten. Das wurde eben genau geschildert, nicht wahr? Ja, und das war eigentlich alles. After the war, Britain loaded 20 old merchant ships with German mustard gas shells, many dated from the first war. Tens of thousands were consigned to the seabed. But the nerve gas shells were not sunk. Instead, Allied scientists investigated Taboon to develop their own supplies.
In the Cold War, both the Soviets and the West produced enough nerve gas to kill everyone in the world several times over. But fear of retaliation again ensured they were never used. In 1993, all chemical weapons were outlawed again. Stockpiles were treated and destroyed. It was no great loss for the nuclear powers of the West. Inject the agent. We in Britain obviously don't need nerve gas. We don't need it because we have plenty of other things that can do the military tasks which nerve gas can do. We have uh, conventional weapons of all sorts. We have nuclear weapons. Uh, we simply don't need nerve gas. No rich, industrialized, militarized country needs it. There are other things. But in conflicts where the victim can't strike back in kind, mass murder by chemical weapons remains a very real threat. If you don't have access to protection, then the weapons look much more attractive to your enemies. That's no doubt why uh, Iraq used chemical weapons uh, during the war with Iran. Chemical weapons are political weapons. They can coerce populations. They can be weapons of terror. The most brutal instance was Saddam Hussein's use of nerve gas against the Kurds in Halabja in 1988. The surprise attack against unprotected people was devastating. 5,000 were killed outright. Fritz Haber once said, a scientist belongs to all mankind in times of peace but to his country in times of war. But the weapon he devised for the fatherland has become the property of all mankind, with horrific consequences.